Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, okay, thank you everyone for joining today's uh, data science working group. Um, we have quite a few items on our agenda. We've got uh, Sean um, discussing uh, research and publication. Um, I don't believe we have Greg um, today unless he, he joins a little later, but uh, we also have Dawn um, providing an update for our license, license changes, changes and forks project. Um, and then some other items as well. And feel free to throw any other agenda items that you'd like to discuss today. Um, so Sean, do you wanna kick us off with um, what you've been working on? Yes, <clears throat> well, the, the, I, what I really want to use with this agenda item for is just to sort of discuss the, the possibility or the way uh, that I work or so there's a group of us uh, who participate in chaos who always who are also using the data um, as a component of academic research and I, I fall into that category and I'm using auger data right now with three of my PhD students to you know, try to analyze and understand patterns of contribution and we're using computational modeling techniques to do that in order to, to understand how different projects take shape or operate over time and what what I would like to do is periodically share uh, some of the preliminary findings or findings that we have under review and uh, bring them up for discussion in, I think the data science working group is probably the most appropriate place to do that. And then when, I, when we do that, I think there could be a, a discussion that occurs. And there, you know, so if, if there are people who are interested in participating directly in the academic components of it, um, I would just want to encourage or enable that to happen. And I, I haven't done that before. And so to some extent, this is uh, me personally trying to merge the sort of uh, two interests that I have. One, of course, is open source software and the way that it functions openly. And the other is academic publishing, which does not function uh, as, much of an, as, as much of an open process. So, you know, sharing what we're doing with the data and how we're making sense of it and getting uh, perspectives from this group and also inviting those who might be interested to contribute as well. And I'll stop there and see if I've explained anything sufficiently to engender a discussion. <clears throat> yeah, I think that makes sense. and. I say let's let's see where it can go. I think this is a great um, community to to share that with, and I think we can get some people to um, to to be part of that. Okay, awesome. I will I will um, prepare some stuff for next meeting then. Yeah, personally, I'm super excited to see what those PhD students are working on and how they're using Augur. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested yeah. to see it. Would you be able to tell us a little bit more about, like, I guess you'll prepare some things, but. Um, yeah. Um, so, so right now we're working on a number of computational models that place any project in an auger database, so any project that we want to examine into a lifecycle maturity category based on models developed using or trained, I suppose you should say, I should say models trained using data from communities or foundations that have categorized the projects within themselves. So CNCF, Apache, um, a few, a few others that have uh, life cycle maturity categories. And so we can, we've been training models using chaos metrics um, and then using those models to uh, identify or classify projects that are not in any of those umbrella organizations as being uh, likely to be in a life cycle state that's different or a life cycle state that is, you know, basically put things in categories to let people navigate through. It's probably easier to explain with a slide, but that's, that's what we're working on right now, primarily. And then there's other things that I'm looking at with open source scientific software as well. So are you saying like 
some of these projects that are in um, foundations may have a maturity model of like, this is incubated versus graduated. Exactly. Together. And then exactly. if it's not within those, they kind of fall into like this other category and then they kind right. of have their own maturity models. Right, so we're using uh, 40 chaos metrics and calculating them and then also calculating them as trends over time and using those parameters to train a model to basically look at only the data that's generated along those 40 chaos metrics and classify what the life cycle state of the project is. And we have a number of internally consistent models that that work against the, the things of origin. And then we're using uh, comparisons of, for example, CNCF and Apache to validate each model. So does the, do we, what is the model for CNCF categories to effectively classify or accurately classify Apache repositories into the life cycle state that Apache has them at? And there are some idiosyncrasies because these are of course two different organizations with two different social structures, but the basic notion of life cycle state is consistent across them, if not consistently implemented. And so instead of trying to use a simple approach, because those simple approaches aren't very accurate, we're using an integration of these 40 chaos metrics to, to classify projects according to these life cycle states, and then use those same models once we've evaluated them to look at a much larger collection, like over 100,000 repositories, and to put them into categories. And over time, of course, it would be good to get some external validation uh, from some of those projects about what they think of where we put them. But that's, that's just one example, right? That's not the only thing, but that's what we've been working on most recently. Oh, is there uh, an, like a hypothesis of where you think how they how you think they compare so the the motive so the motivation is is that the number of projects is overwhelming and having some idea what life cycle state the things that i depend on are in is is useful information and you know there's a lot of a lot of conversations in chaos that tell us that this is useful information and so the hypothesis is that there are some set of characteristics derivable from chaos metrics that are useful for signaling the life cycle state of a project. And by creating a computational model that's validated across a couple of different classification schemes, we have some degree of statistical confidence that the life cycle states that we put things in are consistent with the life cycle states that people operating Apache or CNCF or other places uh, have put them in already. And once that's validated, now we can look at a, a large number of projects and provide a probabilistic indication of where all of these projects that you depend on are in terms of the life cycle state that they're in. And something that's not easily detectable across a very large number of projects, which is the space that most organizations operate in. Yeah. That's super so interesting. Our, so I suppose our hypothesis is we can do it. And we have, um, we have some evidence that we can. We have a, uh, one paper under review and another paper getting close to being under review. Sophia has her hand up. Yes. I'm curious, what's your validation? Sorry, I jumped into this mid conversation. So if you already explained this, are you you're sure. validating using the established parameters per foundation or are there other ways that you're going to go in and see does the project still functionally offer what it says it does and other tests of maturity and functionality right I, no, i've done nothing along the lines of actually functionally examining these projects because the, the hypothesis is around i have a large population of projects can i use chaos metrics uh, trained against organizations that have labeled 
the project lifecycle state that these projects are in. And I build a computational model trained by that data and then effectively use it to, to look out over a much larger population of projects and put them in a probabilistic life cycle state. So there's no consideration of fitness to purpose or even what the purpose is for a particular project right now. That, that's fair. I guess maybe I should have clarified more. I was thinking more like quality measures, which are, I know, often flawed, but there's, depending on the ecosystem you're looking at, there could be established linters and checks that you can run to kind of just gauge other measures of quality. Um, and I'm just as another way to sort of validate whether or not the maturity model is yielding what you think it's doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think including, um, you know, linting projects, I think you're talking possibly about like the to-do group linter. Oh, there's a couple. Like I know PyPy also has a linter. Um, I think Debbie might have one. Like there are project and ecosystem specific tests that can be run. Just so I don't know, but the times that I've looked at quality assessments and academic papers, it's very much test dependent. Um, and then the tests are also ecosystem dependent. So depending on where you focus, you might be able to use a couple of purpose built tools. Um, just to give you another validation method or a way to sort of test whether or not the things that are coming through as mature are actually still quote unquote quality. Because if they're mature, but they have no quality, then I'm not like, how do we interpret that? Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, that's actually quite an interesting piece to add to it. And I think that that information from a practical perspective, people would definitely want to see that as well. And, and I also think it would it would be interesting to run these linters against the foundation projects that are classified uh, to see how they do. Mm -hmm. Like I would expect, I would expect uh, based on my experience dealing looking at a lot of this data, so just using the two largest examples, uh, CNCF likely has quite good scores on the linters regardless of the life cycle state, just because there's an organizational maturity there um, for putting these things that the linters look for in place from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think I would think Apache uh, would have more variability at the different life cycle states of sandbox or graduated. Just because the Apache projects seem to less consistently have all the pieces there at the very beginning. And when I say pieces, I mean the pieces the linters look for. Sounds like you have a hypothesis, so. I yeah, uh, there, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, it's, I, I, I think that's, thank you, Sophia, that's very interesting. And if you have a list of linters that you want to throw in the notes, I would take that. Like, I'm familiar with the to-do group one, but less familiar with some of the. Uh... The, the to-do group one is not at all what Sophia is talking about. I'm familiar with okay. that one. That's something, that's something different. Different, than okay. Sophia's talking about. Yeah, so some examples of these other linters, um, that would be that would be very helpful. Yeah, I feel like I've, I've seen them as references in mm -hmm. if, like in other academic papers that we're trying to use some sort of quality metric. Yeah, uh, but they're all over the place again. And there's always part of me is like, this doesn't actually tell you if a thing works or not, because that's again, that's not a scalable thing to run. Um, but it seems to be an acceptable way to have a quality assessment and at least in, in the paper side. Ooh, yeah, most, right. most languages have, most languages have these and it's, it's really a way of kind of, you know, just, just testing against what their expectations are for the way that the language should, should work. Sounds good. They, they're, they're, they're different for every single programming language. That makes sense. If I'm linting at that level, I would expect it to be different for sure. Yeah. yeah so if, uh, again, if there's some examples, give me get me started on where to look for these linters. I'm sure I could Google it. Yeah, I just posted a link in there which has a whole list of a whole bunch of linters. There's so many. Like, oh yeah, at hundreds, the, hundreds of linters. Yep. <laughs> It's, did you put not, them in the? It's not a small did thing. You put them in, did you put them in the notes or the chat? I put them in the chat. I'll throw them in the notes. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to make your problem bigger. No, no. I mean these are. I mean linters are certainly like the 
this, the, the to-do group linter has certainly been on my uh, agenda because it's very, very general. And that's what I was talking about. Like, it's really looking for the presence of like contributing docs and things like that. And those are yeah. the things that CNCF it's a, it's a generally does at the start. Yeah, it's a, it's a repository linter. Which is not even on this list of linters because it's it's so different from every other linter in existence. I'm yeah. I think it maybe shouldn't have ever been called a linter. I'll be honest. It's it's a repository assessment tool. The the repo, the to do group repo linter. Yeah, I think it's it's technically implemented in a way that's similar to how these linters are implemented, but its functional purpose is very different. If I'm understanding correctly. Any other questions for Sean? No? Okay, so Sean, we look forward to um, hearing more about the project and um, hopefully getting to meet some of your students. Yeah, sounds good. Um, next up, we have Greg showing us some visualizations uh, for Ansible and other projects. Um, Greg, is this still a topic you'd want to talk about now or at the next uh, uh, meeting? I can go either way. Um, I have, uh, I have, I can go over it if you want. Um, yeah, we have time. Very, ha very happy to do that. Um, since Sean is on the call, I should probably caveat this a little bit. <laughs> because, this, what, because this is this is data that should be generated through Augur. And every time I, I, I keep meaning to port it to Augur and I keep I keep yeah. getting halfway through that project and then either hitting something and coming to talk to you and Callie about it and then it ends up. That is not you know how it goes that is how it goes uh, well no it's at least partially my fault um so this uh what i will if i can um grab the screen sharing that would be wonderful um so let me just okay um, let me stop i can stop i think uh, i've stopped me, uh, screen sharing let me pull this up so okay so this this what I'm going to show is um, based on some thinking I did some years back, actually. Um, and it's just, it, it kind of just sat there and we use it a lot. Um, and we uh, we haven't really evolved it uh, from any further. But I think, I still think it's interesting and worth talking about. And it's based on, uh, are you seeing my screen, by the way? Is that, is that right? I am. Yes, good. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll jump into one of these reports in a minute, but I just want to lay the, the groundwork first. Um, the basic idea is, we're interested in looking at our community. So, so I was I was brought onto the Ansible project originally to help with a data analysis view of the Ansible community because it's so massive, right? Um, most most of the time, you can for smaller projects, one or two people can kind of hold it in their head. But the Ansible team knew they couldn't do that. It was thousands and thousands of contributors, and they wanted to get someone to to help do some of the just the ETL type stuff, right? It's not particularly modeling based. It's just summarizing stuff. And so the question I set myself was, how do we determine or, or have a sensible definition for an active contributor? Uh, and so, and I know this is a question Kelly and I have talked a lot about over the last couple of years as well. Uh, at the time, and still, my definition comes from a thing called the Orbit model. So the Orbit went and made a company around this, right? Um, but their original model was actually fairly simple. It was that you take all of the activities that you can count for a given person, you weight them, give them arbitrary point scores, um, and then you time decay them, so that's an exponential. Uh, you know, it's less than less than one, so it decays over time. And you sum it up, right? So you have you have this time decayed activity score for every person in your community, and then you do things with that score, right? Uh, and so that led to these two plots. So the first thing I did was to take the list. So I've got all the thousands of people in my community. I can add up all of their activities. And then I can say, how many people reach a certain bar? Um, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say that the person who turns up and opens one issue in our Git, one of our GitHub repos isn't still valid and a contributor. They're not the highest person on my list when it comes to who are my key contributors, right? And so, I want to set some threshold and say, if you raise this many issues, this many PRs, this much um forum answers whatever you can count and however you score it you know you put relative weights in um if we get over this threshold we're going to count you okay so it's crude but it works 
Uh, and, uh, and so I've been doing this for a while, uh, and this is the sort of plot you can do. So you can count the number of people in your community that reach that bar, and you can plot it over time. It turns out to be very, very easy to cast this back in time, uh, just because of the way the maths works. Um, and so you can plot it over time, and you can see what's happening. Now, Ansible has been declining for years. When I first started doing this, that number was around 1,000 active contributors a month. And I have a pretty high bar. I use, so to, to, to set some context for this, to give you some something to, to hold on to, I use one point for an issue. This is just GitHub data. I use one point for an issue. I think it's one point, uh, I've got it at the end here. It's 1.4 for a PR, because that needs more effort. Um, and comments are worth a fair bit unless you're commenting on your own thing because you have a uh, vested self-interest in commenting on your own thing and bumping it up and getting people's attention right uh, so uh, so if you've gone to the effort of finding somebody else's issue and saying hey i've got that issue too or if you've you hero have gone to the effort of actually doing a pr review uh, which is the thank most thankless task in open source right um then um we score those things quite highly so i'm just counting issues prs and the comments therein uh, and then adding it all up because we have hundreds of thousands of, of issues and PRs across the Ansible uh, space. It's 600 so, repos in total. Can I ask a question? Of course, Sean, please. I'm, uh, I'm curious about the not including commits um, and the rationale there. I'm not judging it or saying it's good or bad. I'm just curious about it. So I want to count things that didn't get in. There's still effort. Commits are yep. only merged things, right? And also identifying people is a completely different mechanic in commits, right? With GitHub, I have the yeah. GitHub ID, which does not make it through to the commit log. And so okay. tying that into the rest of the data set, if I want to look at issues and tie it into people's activity in the commits, I basically can't do it. Um, not easy, very, very difficult anyway, I think. I know Orga has a lot of good stuff around identity, and it's something I really want to explore better. Um, yeah, yeah. But but for now, yeah, I, I didn't take commits specifically because it doesn't take account of work done that maybe for good reasons did not then get in. Yeah, um, no, that's, that's, that's it's, good. It's that's, about activity. It's about activity. Yeah, yeah. So. okay, sure. And to some extent, yeah. commits overlap with pull requests. And, right, and the other thing yeah. is there's a nesting thing, right, because a PR can hold many commits. Yeah. Uh, which is the other thing um, that you've got to take account of. So, but I mean, commits are equally valid, and I have a, data, a similar data set for commits. Um, yeah. but, but issues and PRs worked out to be more valuable for us. No, that makes that makes total sense. I just I yeah. really just wanted to understand the choice. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a perfectly good question. Thank you. Appreciate it. So that this is the first part, which is a dead easy time series part. The more fun one you can do is then to flip it around and say, well, okay, instead of just putting a threshold cut off and counting everybody above it. What's, who's at the top of the table, right? Who are my top 20 people by score? Um, because those are the people I want to go talk to, right? And, and, and I would argue that most community people know who at least the top 10 are in their community, right? But who's in 11 to 20? Who's up and coming? Who's drifting? That's the questions you really want to answer, right? And so we came up with this plot. And so I need to just, this is based entirely on the orbit um, idea that came out of the people running the orbit.co stuff. So the idea is the project is in the center of the plot. And for each of the people in the top 20, we can do the same back casting of their activity score. So I can look at what their activity is this month, last month, go back a year. I've got 12 values, put a very simple straight line through that, right? And I've got an idea of whether they're getting more active or less active. And I can use, I can use the slope of that line to create a vector. And so I can look at people and say, this person's getting strongly less active. Um, this is a bot that needs to be filtered out. I missed that one. Uh, but this person's getting a little bit more active. This person, Felix Fontaine, is by far our number one contributor, and he is right at the center because that's where that's the highest score, right? But um, he's getting even more active. The arrow just about points inwards. So again, he's leaving. This is a really useful plot to be like, who's active? Who's coming in? Who's up and coming? Who's drifting? Who do I need to go talk to? Who's a new name that I don't recognize that I should go and chat with? Right. And so that literally that's the whole thing. That's it. There's just those two plots. I mean, I did some other stuff as well, which I'm less interested in, to be honest. I had a go up doing I don't know if you're familiar with Dow Mao plots from uh, from like social media where you look at mm -hmm. stickiness. I had a go at doing a stickiness thing for GitHub. I had to up the scale because um, nobody looks at GitHub daily. Or very few people look at GitHub daily. Right. So I tried to get it over a week so we could deal with the Saturday, Sunday problem. Uh, so it became yeah. it became we weekly versus half year rather than daily versus monthly. It turns out the ratio is about the same. Right. Uh, so I had to go at that. I have no idea why this has gone to zero. I need there's a, clearly a bug in my code somewhere. <laughs> um, but you know, usually when, 
In terms usually of stickiness, it's not bad. Usually when I see something trail off at the end, it just means I haven't collected that data, honestly. I mean, we are we are mid-September, so it could well be that. Yeah. Um, but in any case, 10 to 12% stickiness is not too bad. And, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of survival analysis, so there's a whole, whole bit of survival analysis down here um, because I really hate it when people say, this is my average time to close. And I'm like, you're lying. It's not true. Um, so, because uh, they take a mean, right? And it doesn't work. But the, the bit that I want, wanted to show off was these two up here because I think the, the, the underlying maths of that and the fact that you can then make these polar plots. And of course, it's based entirely just off GitHub data, which means you can then filter it by repos of interest. So this one's over all of the 500 plus GitHub repos that are uh, across six or seven GitHub organizations. Uh, yeah, 36 GitHub organizations. That's because we have six organizations of our own. And then on top of that, um, we've got all of the collections that make up the Ansible community package, which live in other people's organizations, right? Uh, so there's one or two repos plucked from various places, and then we've got six orgs of our own that we just index all of. Um, Kelly wants me to go over the survival curves. Okay, I will in a minute. Yeah, I was going to, I actually was going to jump on yeah. that too. I think that's, yeah. I, would like, I would like to. But anyway, the point, the point here is you can jump in and you can say, well, I'm interested in AWX or I'm interested in DevTools or, you know, whatever. And you get the same, you get consistent plots that I, I took a while to educate the people around me how to read these things. And then obviously I wanted it to be consistent after that. So um, filtering it down. This is all built using, um, R, as it happens, so it doesn't really matter. It's using Quarto, if you're familiar with Quarto, um, which is similar to Jupyter Notebook, right? It's a, it's a way of writing code and text at the same time and outputting it. One thing I like about Quarto is you can tell it to output a website. So it will just create, a, it'll act like a static site generator. It'll go and run all the code and output all of the reports as a static site, and then I can just host it. Boom, done. Um, so that, that works really, really nicely. Um, all right, survival analysis then. Okay, so same data set. Um, the the point of this was to get my the, my colleagues in the Ansible uh, commu uh, community and, and business um, to try and start thinking of interesting strata because that's what I like about survival analysis is you can put strata through it right and start looking at the differences between groups um, and so this was an example of how to do that and they just never really took me up on it which is unfortunate so this was me looking at time to close um, and so you can who's familiar with survival analysis um, and doesn't need me to explain what survival analysis is I'm hoping that I, I can dispense with, with the, the, the core of that does anyone want me to talk the basics of survival analysis first so I can explain what these plots are going once all right if, if I need to then tell me <laughs> I'm happy to do so, but I don't want to take up everybody's airtime. Um, so the basic of survival analysis, right? The reason I like it for community work is because if I take a mean or a median, if I say my median time to close is four days, what have I just said? Well, an, an average is a measure of central tendency, right? So what I've just said is that half my community have this experience, um, which to be honest, isn't great. I would like to know where the 75, 80% line is, I want most of my community to have a good experience, right? And so that's what I like about survival curves is that whilst the median, I think, if I remember my math correctly, the median is the 50% line, I can take a different line on this curve and, and pick up and see uh, what's going on. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. So what this is, is time to close uh, for uh, Redis pull requests. And I can see that you know, the, the median I would get is a couple of days, right? But it's not really the whole story. And actually, if you go up to most of the community, let's say 75%, it's actually more like three weeks, which seems much more realistic number for the size of our community, actually. You're not going to get stuff languishing, right? Um, and likewise, issues stay open forever, right? You, you, you never even see it reach barely past 20% because people just don't close issues. But what I think is interesting is you can then strata that and say, well, is there a difference between people who work for Red Hat and people who don't? <laughs> or at least, shall we say, core developers, you could look at it that way. So in the case of Ansible, the two things work out to be almost identical um, because of just Ansible's governance. Um, but here you can see a really interesting thing, and I think it makes sense, is that for staff, they get there's a much sharper shoulder. They get their PRs in quicker. That makes sense. They know the process. They can go and poke somebody if they need to. But their issues actually take longer. It's actually lower down than the non-staff curve. And I think that makes sense too, because I think most developers will just go and fix the problem rather than raising an issue. Right? So when they do, it tends to be a gnarly thing that we need to discuss. Uh, and so it sits open forever. Right? Or it's just some, some random idea for a feature request or whatever that nobody ever does anything with. So 
I like I like survival analysis. I think you can do a lot more with this. Um, I like the idea of applying survival analysis to any other time to event data. So I have done various experiments that have never made it into reports, but things like how long does it take a maintainer to respond to an issue is a really interesting question because it gives you an idea of that. The, the, the question I was asking at the time was how, um, how do you tell the difference between stable and dead? Um, because actually a stable project looks very quiet, right? From from sort of first order activity stuff where you look at commits or, or whatever, it's not a lot happening. But but if you open an issue and someone responds, then it's stable, right? Uh, so, so there's that one. There's also the new contributor thing. How long does it take for a new contributor to make a second contribution? Is a really interesting metric. Can we are we sticky? Are we keeping people, or are most people never coming back? Um, that's that's an interesting piece of survival analysis as well. And again, once you start looking at those things, you can start structuring it by the type of pull request or the type of project or whatever you want to do. Right. So anyway, I didn't want to make this. I, I wanted I, this was the thing that, that you asked me to to show. So <laughs> I'll stick with that. Uh, anyway, that that's all of it really. This is the the sort of one of the big um, things that I built a couple of years ago, and we've been using it ever since. Um, I find it really useful. This one in particular, I find it very, very useful. Um, I don't know if we already have this and more in other parts of Chaos, um, so I may well be talking nonsense, um, but uh, you wanted to see it, so there you go. <laughs> Questions? I see a hand up, finally. Elizabeth? Hi, yeah, it's me. Um... I'm just wondering if you do any or have done any uh, community type surveys or um, interviews with people to that would um, supplement your data and, and verify that, you know, what you suspect based on the data is in fact what is happening. So I think I could split that in two halves. We I'm actually writing a survey for the Ansible community right now, but it will be one of those big ones where we get we want lots and lots and lots of replies. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, that's not going to be an interview style survey where we get lots of uh, qualitative data. It's going to be more lots of multiple choice and like what version of it's, it's open source, right? I don't even know what version of Ansible's are out there in the wild, and we know we have a lot of users. It's a big project, right? There's my conservative guess is that it's low millions in the in terms of Ansible users, just because it's so so ubiquitous. Uh, but I don't know the distribution of Ansible versions that people use, and it bugs me. So it's going to be that kind of survey, right? Um, that said, I, I I'm fairly confident of this polar plot because it's not really a polar plot; <laughs> it just looks like one. Um, but it. Uh, it's because it's the names on there. I recognize at least half of them. Every time I've done it, and I've been doing it for years, I know the names that are on it and then, and what they represent. And then I see new names, and I go and look at them, look at them in GitHub and go, "Oh, that makes perfect sense. They have indeed been contributing to these repos over here." And then they this comes up when people come to the community team within Red Hat and say, "We need a maintainer for X. Who do we have? Like, who's active?" And I'm like, "Well, A, don't you know? <laughs> but also B, here are some names <laughs> for your part of the project, right? Um, so yeah, we haven't, I'm not sure how you'd interview. So so the, the first thing to say is these are public and the community have been able to look at them for years and some of them do, but not many. Um, but I'm not sure how, how I'd validate it with an interview. That's an interesting way of looking at it. I'd, I'd be interested to hear more about your thoughts on that. But I also see there's another hand up as well. Or two, even. <laughs> Hi, Sean. Yeah, my, my question is, what does the proximity to the middle of the circle indicate? And I, I think the, the what? Score. It's the, the, the most active people are in the middle. All right. And what does the size of the node That's indicate? That's the number of items. So you can imagine that there might be someone who did a lot of stuff a long time ago. And so the individual contributions to their score is low because of that exponential. But there's okay. still a lot of items in their list. And I wanted, uh, it's a way for me to see at a glance that this is someone who's been very busy, but somehow they're not in the middle. So it must be that they were busy a long time ago, right? I see, I see. And then the, the arrows are the trend of their activity. Right, exactly. So that's that's okay. the that's the vector through their historical scores um, as right. to whether they're getting more or less active. Yes. That was my question. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Sean? Thanks, Greg. Um, I want... I, I think this is kind of a general question for the whole group, but I wonder if there's any um, qualitative data or information about how maintainers 
approach um, their issues or pull requests? Because I think in you presenting this, it made me start to think of like, um, it, like time to close, like in, like when you're going through your pull requests, you kind of go through like, well, this one's pretty easy. So I'll just, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll do this one and close it. Or I know this one's only going to take 10 minutes. Um, and then there's like that comp compounding effect of like, okay, we have a hundred. Now we have 200 pull requests. Now we have 300. And then it's like, we don't know if we'll ever get to that, <laughs> ever get to closing all of them. And so then you, you know, you, you start waiting even longer. Um, so I don't know if there's any information around. I, that. so that's a really good question um i can't answer it directly um uh, because um i'll be honest i haven't asked them uh but i really like your point about you know this one's easy this one's hard i actually had a go at that when i was first teaching myself survival analysis years ago i went and did exactly that for um for a whole pile of prs in the community i used to work in which is a community called foreman um and um if you if you'll um Permit me, I will. Oh, I'll, I'll just put the link in chat. You can have a look at it for yourself. Actually, that's probably easier rather than me screen sharing it. Uh, um, but there's um, this was from 2019, and basically, the way I it is quite possible that this analysis is not valid because survival analysis is quite sensitive to like time varying effects and things like that. But and I was just learning right and playing around, but at least for a basic analysis, absolutely. The complexity of the PR obviously has an effect on the time it takes to get it merged. But what I found really interesting was that far more strong was the number of files that it touched. If you have one PR of 100, and it makes sense, right? If you have one one file touched with 100 lines of change in it, or five files touched with 20 lines of change in it, it's the same amount of change, but it's a lot harder to review, right? Um, so it made it kind of made sense to me. Um, I will also put a link to the uh, to the GitHub reports um, into chat as well, or into the notes rather, so that we've got it uh, for later. Yeah, that's so have a look at. Um, so yeah, um, it, it, it's it's re I really love survival analysis, um, but I think the problem is that because it it generally looks at historical data sets rather than things that are live right now, right? Um, and GitHub is changing all the time, uh, so it can be a little tricky to get that right, but. My hope is that it's still ballpark, even if you, like, if it was a really m minor effect, I'd be worried that we'd either read it the wrong side of the line, as it were, but usually these things are pretty strong, and I have some faith that there's some truth in them. Yeah, thank you for sharing this. This is um, really great. I'll have to put on my to-do to read. Uh, Sophia, you have a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, sort of the reception and impact it's had on the team itself. Like, who's most interested in looking at the data outside of the people that are interested in data? And what do, what do they do with that? So to, to set the scene, um, Ansible, with internal to Red Hat, has a thing called the Ansible community team, which exists in engineering. Um, and they're obviously the main consumers of that. So I was originally brought into the Ansible team five years ago to do the data for that team. Now, things have shifted around um, internally over the years. So I do a variety of other things that are less fun um but um but i still maintain that stuff for them they are the primary consumers i was the only data person on that team in fact i think i'm technically the only data scientist in the whole business unit um but um yeah i know <laughs> uh but so so there's there's me building it and there's probably six or seven other people in the community team who use it and then occasionally I will take that data set and parse it in other ways to answer questions like for our marketing team who want to put a number on the Ansible Fest stage as to how many contributors we've got and they want the biggest number they can possibly have, right? And so I will go and stop doing all the clever math and just count the number of rows on the table and tell them it's 30,000 people or something. Um, but, uh, but we don't admit that I do that. So... <laughs> so, as for impact, um, its main use... There's two main uses. One is just knowing who to go talk to when we need them. The impact I would have liked it to have, which we never quite got set up, and I'm still pushing them to do it, is that I would have been using this for coffees. I would have been using this for knowing who to go and ha have regular coffee with in the community so that you can get a temperature of what's going on out there in the community. That's what I used to do in Foreman. Um, know who your key people are is an important rule, right? But doing that in a big project is hard when there's 600 repositories 30 odd chat rooms we now have this massive forum which helps because it's all in one place but even so that's a different type of person that tends to inhabit that space right so 
knowing who to go talk to becomes a data question and that's what those were built for um and so while they use it in some ways they don't use it in my opinion the best way but yeah time pressure awesome thank you so much greg this is really this is really interesting to see very cool yeah, thank you, thank you. Oh, very welcome uh, so i'm 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 sure we've all got other stuff going on that I would love to, I would learn just as much from. I don't want to claim I know lots of things, <laughs> especially this. Uh... <sighs> no, this, this is great. Thank you. Um, if there's any um, interest in doing something without writing out somewhere, I'm happy to explore that. Um, I would, if it's useful to people, I can. Well, the code's all public anyway. Actually, let me go and put the link to that in the, in the notes because um, it all it all just runs in a set of containers. Um, so there's. There's two containers. And yes, it's written in R, but it wouldn't be hard to translate. We're always happy to take posts on the Chaos blog if there is something well, you want to... Uh, if, you, if you think it's useful, I, I can probably... I think, it might, I think it might be interesting. I mean, especially... Um, in particular, I think what would be interesting to the community is around that Orbit model. Because I think hmm. a lot of people think about Orbit as the company which has, right. I guess, gone out of business. And I don't think a lot oh, of Oh, has it gone? Have they gone now? Interesting. So, there so the something, interesting... or they got sold, or something gonna, happened to the company itself. So, so um, what's really interesting about Orbit was really early on when they were setting up, they had the entire model in GitHub of what they wanted to do. And so I went, oh, that's useful. I'm going to try and implement that. <laughs> and so I did. And of course, about six months later, they realized that they were kind of giving away the secrets. Uh, and so they took it off GitHub. Um, but by then, I had already written my maths, so <laughs> it was fine. Um, the actual, I mean, they made it a lot more complex in the end, and they probably needed to in order to, to, to try and interest people, right? Um, because yeah. the basic idea of waiting something, time decaying it, you know, 0 0.9 to the power months is all it does. Um, and then adding it up, it's not super complex, right? Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it's not it's, there anymore. And I think it's a really fascinating way of looking at looking at community personally. Mm -hmm. And I think that particular part would be really interesting to some of the chaos folks. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to, to look into doing that. Um, I promised a lot of things to a lot of people. We'll have to figure out when I can do it, but. <laughs> We're not in yeah. here. But I no, that's fair enough. As I said, the, I think Orbit were onto something and I, I I wanted to like their tool. I tried it out and it just I, it didn't quite land for me in terms of how they had the UI set up and everything. So yeah. I that was just like, that. No, I'm gonna write my own. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. Okay, so in the in the three minutes we have left, I am going to very quickly just mention that I have the uh, forks and license data that I went through in this last in the last meeting is all in the repository now. So I have the data, but it's not just the data. I also have there's some stuff that people can work on if they're if they're interested. Um, in particular, we need to think about what project health metrics from chaos we want to run against these projects to start looking at the differences between the original project before and after relicensing, between the original project and the fork. I think there's lots of interesting stuff to look at. Um, and we have a Google Doc where I've started putting together the, you know, we'll do some kind of a report. Um, but this doc also has, if you go down to the methods, it has like the research questions. So you can get a feel for the types of things that I was thinking. We can add more research questions. We can we can do whatever we want with this. But I wanted people to know that the, the data's there, the request for, for help on the project. So um yeah, so so have a look. And all of it's all of the data itself is in the, the notebooks. Um so you can see the um Jupyter notebooks and just kind of look through. I've got a summary at the top with kind of the TLDR. And then you know what I what I did to gather all the data, and then the um, there's also data files. So all of the commits that I gathered from the GitHub API are stored in these pickle files um, based on different timeframes and different projects. So you can actually, if you're interested, you can just load those those pickle files and see see what the commit data looked like. Um, and if you see any mistakes, uh, let me know. Oh, and there's an Open UK research event that's at four o'clock my time, 10 o'clock US Central on Friday, where we're gonna talk about forks and relicensing. So James Governor from Red Monk is gonna be there to talk about um, the research that they did at Red Monk on whether or not um, relicensing has any financial impact on the company. Um, the answer is 
based on the small data set of companies that have relicensed and have financial data, the answer to that is no, there is no financial impact to the company, uh, which is kind of interesting. So he's going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about data. I think Amanda Brock is going to talk about some forks and relicensing stuff as well. So, so that should be interesting. And I will, I'll grab that. Uh, I'll grab that link. I think I've got it Thanks, right. Helen. Yeah. So we good. have a minute to, for your question. One, I'm super excited you're doing that with them because I think that's going to be a really interesting conversation. Um, and thanks for showing up with data as well. I think that's always really cool. Um, just looking at your doc, um, is there a place that you want to start collecting metrics? Because I feel like you probably have a couple in your head already. So I don't want to be like reiterate things you're already thinking about. Um, but I was looking at the research question section. Do you want to just expand that project health um, like, do you want to expand something on metrics? I'm just kind of curious where we can shove things in to be helpful without breaking your template. Uh, that's that's a really good that's a really good question. Um, I would say, if if the if the metrics themselves are applicable to like a like a specific research question, you could just drop them in here. Maybe not. Let me let me think about this a little bit. Where. You could also put, we could also create an appendix or a notes section where we put notes for things. Maybe that would be a better, a better I think place. It could be, yeah. Cause I don't, I don't want to like crowd it with a bunch of like random thoughts. <laughs> like I want, like, I think what you have structured, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but something like listing 40 odd metrics might just break your format in a way that's untenable. Um, so I think. If we shove it in appendix, that make, that makes sense to me. And then as this continues to evolve, you can figure out how to incorporate it in the way that makes the most sense. But this is really cool. Thank you for kicking this off. Yeah, thanks. We ran yeah. out of time for the uh, Open Source Summit retrospective. Did anybody have anything burning that they wanted to talk about from the Open Source Summit? I can wait. OK. <laughs> I can I can move this. We can move this to next time. Maybe by next time. I'll have videos. I missed you, Sean. I heard you were there, and somehow I didn't see you. <laughs> nope, Sean is Sean is gone. Sean, <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> Sean had some some uh, travel difficulties and was a bit late, so he was only yeah. There. I see. Sean was here as long as he was. He was in Vienna as long as he was in this call. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the last for missing him because I saw him in the schedule. I was like, Sean's here? I haven't seen Sean. Yeah, I sent him a message like Monday night. I was like, where are you? I haven't seen you all day. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm not there yet. Oh, okay. So he, he made it into Vienna Tuesday night for the Wednesday day, but better late. Okay, we're out of time. Let's give people eight minutes to do whatever until the chaos community meeting at the top of the hour. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Have a good Bye. Week, everybody. Right.